being a specialist in brain cancer, I can tell you that brain cancer is a terrible cancer like you alluded to. It's, uh, it's the number one cancer killer in children. It kills more children than any other disease and it kills more young adults than any other cancer. And you're right, it has uh, been ranked number one by all studies in developing countries as the cancer that uh, has the greatest uh, socio-economic impact on society. <clears throat> the cost is in the billions, of course, in both your country and our country when it comes to brain cancer. That's what I do know. I also know that I had a patient who had brain cancer who was exposed to huge amounts of uh, uh, EMR from um, owning a transport company. He said he was on it for at least eight hours a day and so were his partners. And they weren't related at all, but he died of brain cancer. All four partners in the company died of brain cancer. And then his wife rang us up two years after he died to say that the secretary, who was also on the mobile phone, died of brain cancer. So I do know that uh, if you're exposed enough to EMR, you will get brain cancer and you'll die from it. Uh, I'm sure you are aware of the studies uh, showing that if you live around high tensile electrical wires, uh, these were studies out of uh, Scandinavia, but then validated by a study out of Chicago showing that you have a higher incidence of leukaemia and brain cancer if you live around high tensile wires, so we do know that, that's a fact. We also know that brain cancer is increasing in frequency, we know that is a fact. And the other thing that I think is most scary is the fact that uh, those of you who are scientists in the room would realise that statistically it takes a lot of robust uh, data to uh, prove... Uh, well, to negate a null hypothesis. And with the Interphone study, it was designed to show that there was no link between brain cancer and mobile phone usage, but indeed it showed that there was a link uh, in those people who use their phones uh, for what they call high, high usage, which was only half an hour a day. <coughs> I also know that they excluded two very, very high risk groups, and that is children, less than 18, and corporate users of mobile phones who tend to use their phone more than other people. So I think that's unfair. And I also know that the lead author of that study uh, was upset that they didn't include children and went on to, of course, study uh, children in another study. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that we do know that are very concerning. Uh, I also know that Australia is very poor in terms of truth in labelling. Uh, I'm also a great advocate for animal welfare. And uh, I'm sure you are all aware of the terrible usage of palm oil and the destruction of the habitat of orangutans to get palm oil, we simply asked the government back in 2008-2009 to have truth in labelling so that we would know which products contained palm oil and which didn't so that the public would have a fair say in what product they used and of course that was rejected even though it had bipartisan support before a contingent of uh, vested interest people came out from Borneo and, and, con and, con and changed their minds. So uh, when it comes to mobile phones, I think Australia could take the lead. I mean, we took the lead when it came to uh, compulsory seat belt wearing, uh, compulsory helmet to bicycle helmet wearing, and we saw the major health benefits from those two uh, initiatives. So, so I'd fact, love to see, yeah, I'd love to see Australia uh, come up with a truth in labelling when it comes to mobile phones. I was going to say this, these issues of palm oil and cell phone radiation, mobile phone radiation, share the fact that truth in labelling is what's needed. And the, you have a right to know, a uh, basic right to know is a fact essential to democracy. Democracy rests on the freely given consent of the governed to be governed. Right? You consent to be governed. And in order to consent to be exposed to mobile phone radiation, you have to know what you're being exposed to. And here you have the manufacturers putting the information deep within the operating system, and people are completely unaware of it. So I think that with your leadership and with people here in this room, such as Karen, Chris, and others, the right to know whether it's palm oil or mobile phone radiation ought to be heartily supported. It's, it's long overdue, and I, I think the thing for me that's so exciting is that this really is an honor to meet you, is to realize that you're a leader on that issue and that perhaps together we can do something positive on, on this one as well. Because it's clear that industry is aware you cannot keep a phone in your pocket without exceeding the as-tested guidelines. Right? You all did not know that. Right? Your heart is an electric organ. So is your brain. You want to protect them. If you have to keep a phone in your pocket, put it on airplane mode. This month's issue of Consumer Reports, a major national publication in the United States, highly respected, 
says nobody should keep a phone in their pocket when it's on. So maybe we can talk more with the audience here. If you have questions for Dr. Teo or me, and we'd love to talk more about my presentation. And because you are an expert on this issue, I invite you to share that stage with me. Perhaps we can uh, get a chair up here so we can sit together. Is that possible? Right? Thank you, Chris. Right? And I'll open it up for questions now. I have two questions. Uh, the first is that I notice we have video cameras here, and could you give some information about where we might uh, get access to the video recording of this talk uh, later on? Uh, my second question relates to something you haven't had time to talk about, I'm sure, but uh, that is uh, where can we find more information about the mechanisms that might be affecting the cells? Um, my son, one of my sons who's a research scientist says statistics is what you do when you've got no idea how something works. Uh, I think that's true <laughs> to some extent and maybe you can't have such an idea but can we get access, uh, could you just put, give us a reference to sources where the actual mechanisms of what's going on might uh, be added to the marvellous amount of information you've given us. So first of all, where can we get access to this video recording and uh, can we get further information about some other aspects of the problem. Chris, do you know the answer about the video? Um, the Yes, I will. In a second. Two questions. Well, wait. There is a second part of the question about mechanisms, and I'd like to address it very briefly. Um, first, let me say that as someone who's a cancer epidemiologist, the mechanisms question is very difficult to answer, and we still don't fully understand the mechanism by which tobacco causes cancer. We know that it has within it over 2,000 chemicals, some of which can directly damage DNA. Asbestos causes cancer. We all know that. But guess what? It doesn't directly damage DNA. It's what we call an epigenetic carcinogen. So there are, cancer is a complex of many different diseases. That's number one. And we don't fully understand the mechanism for many things that we accept are associated with poor health, tobacco and asbestos being two examples. So often, the question of mechanism is thrown up as a red herring. You don't have any mechanism, forget it. There's no problem. Well, let me tell you. There are studies suggesting this is interfering with calcium transport. It affects um, drugs that are designed to enhance calcium transport. So that's one very essential mechanism to every cell in the body. There is suggestion that it increases heat shock proteins, reactive oxygen species, and I don't want to bore this non-technical audience with a bunch of things. You can find some of that information on our website, ehtrust.org, and on other, there's a website managed by the German government called emfportal.de. And it has a complete list. It's one of the most uh, complete sources that I know of. The reality is this is the kind of research that should be supported by major national and international efforts. And the, word, the Chinese have a proverb, a way of looking is a way of not looking. And we've been not looking just like the interphone study was designed not to find something, but did find something, we've been not looking at this issue for a long time. And I believe we, we've really reached a tipping point now because of people like you who are here this evening who are going to see that the policies change on the right to know about palm oil, about mobile phone radiation, and move forward the much needed research that we do need in this field. There's one also really interesting phenomenon that uh, I think you'll find uh, quite fascinating. That is that we do, there's many, there's many, uh, sp there's a lot of speculation about what causes brain cancer, but there's only one real uh, carcinogen that's uh, well accepted, and that's ionising radiation. And yet we treat brain cancer with ionising radiation. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, a, 
uh, uncomfortable paradox. Uh, and now we're actually treating some brain conditions with EMR, non-ionising radiation. So it just seems uh, almost like it's, uh, the, the, the theory is being duplicated, and that is that you know, EMR can cause brain cancer and can also treat brain cancer similar to ionising radiation. And I think that's a very interesting phenomenon. Let me add something to that, because the, the NovoCure device, and there are other yeah. things out there, one of the things that may be happening is affects post-mitotic spindle formation, which is what's involved in, in, in malignant cells reproducing. But another, there are other technologies recently in, in the pipeline and approved that use um, RF radiation to weaken membranes so you can enhance, enhance the delivery of chemotherapy. So clearly, if you can weaken membranes with radiofrequency radiation, yeah. how can you possibly assert that they have no negative effects? It, it's ludicrous. But just remember what Deborah said first of all, and that is that it is very difficult to uh, define what's actually ha happening when it comes to carcinogenic agents such as EMR. I mean, really, when it came to cigarette smoking, we had no idea of the mechanism. It was an association, clear association, for many, many decades before a mechanism was really uh, postulated. Um, I have two <coughs> questions. What was it in 1997 that provoked Lloyd's to put in the exclusion, that's the first question. Second question is, have any studies been done on service personnel who were using radio during the war for hours on end, day after day, week after week, yep. etc.? cetera? Yep. Um, thank you. Um, I, I think you'll have to ask Lloyds about 1997, but what I surmise or deduce is that the growing experimental literature at that point had become very robust. Uh, there was a, something called the reflex study in Europe 15 laboratories, several million dollars, and it was designed to show there was no effect on brain cells from RF radiation. And I, I've, in my book, I talk about this. Uh, there's a chapter called The Doctor Who Danced with the Devil, about how he set the study up. He was convinced there was no problem. They started to get results showing it was damaging brain cells. So they went out and bought new equipment because they thought it must be an artifact. It's got to be a mistake. There's no way this weak radiation could be damaging the brain. After three times around, they finally concluded, oh, it does actually damage the brain. That was in 1997 or so. So the results started to come in. You've answered my question. All right. <laughs> I can't be sure, but I think that may have had something to do with it. In terms of the service personnel, there's not a month that goes by that I'm not asked to be an expert witness when it comes to some serviceman suing uh, his respective government for brain cancer. So it is very, uh, there's several class action lawsuits currently being run. Uh, I have several patients myself who were naval officers who spent hours and hours a day next to these big radar things. They felt the heat coming off them and they had brain right. cancer. So uh, the jury is out there, but it's uh, but Actually, it's I'm, not, I, I'm not sure I would say the jury is out because I think there, there, there are some studies on testicular cancer for radar technicians. Cancer, yeah. And there may, there may be some studies now, brain cancer as well. So it's an excellent suggestion, but again, if we really want to know the answer, we've got to make a commitment to setting up the resources and the infrastructure to answer it. And it wouldn't be that hard. Let me give you an example. The Indians are doing a 5,000-person cross-sectional study. You could do it here in Australia. I hope that Uni Melbourne is going to be interested, and maybe you will be interested. Here's what you do. You get 5,000 people who are of similar social class, and you just run them through all the standard clinical assays, CBC, sed ray, glucose, et cetera, et cetera, and sperm count, measures from the saliva of all kinds of things you can get of genotoxicity and cortisol and whatnot, and you get detailed billing records and information about cell phone use, and you organize them into high, medium, and low use. They're doing it in India. They've devoted the resources to it, and the preliminary results from one segment of it shows severe hearing loss in the heaviest users. So you can, it can be done. It's a cross-sectional study. It doesn't take as long to crank through the data. It takes, it's a huge commitment. In the Indian government, they have more than 60 MDs on this study. I wonder sometimes if they're ever going to be able to publish it. But, the, but it's the kind of thing that can be done and should be done to answer your question. Um, <clears throat> A couple of questions from a friend of mine that can't be here. She was caught between two people piggybacking with Wi-Fi and became electro-hypersensitive <clears throat> electro and, got, and got quite ill. The first question is, 
Is there any evidence that the blood-brain barrier can heal itself? I believe it gets damaged with EMF, etc. And my second question, um, well, maybe it's even from me. Uh, you were talking about your work on passive smoke in airplanes. She comes to stay with me. I don't use Wi-Fi. I have over 20 Wi-Fi networks beaming through my flat in a small block of flats. Wow. She's got a very sophisticated meter. The levels are quite astonishing. Wow. Um, and I don't see any difference between that. By the way, I'm a smoker, so I don't smoke. I don't, uh, you know, I've got to go and, and stand outside on yes, the sir. main road to smoke. Right. Get over 20 um, right. networks. And last but not least to everyone here, um, my naughty cat sometimes turns on the Wi-Fi on my printer, which is more powerful as measured than a lot of your Wi-Fi routers. Yeah. But she's particularly interested in whether the blood-brain barrier can, can heal itself. What's the cat printing? Sorry? <laughs> no. <laughs> wow. Do you have any comments? Um, I don't know the data on it. Yeah. No, no. The, the problem with electro hypersensitivity is that there are a lot of bogus studies out there that claim there's no effect. And the studies are designed to fail. For example, they study people and they study them only for a short term immediate effect, when in fact the effect can take hours or days to develop. Not everybody who's sensitive feels it right away. So it's, and there again, uh, there's got to be a national commitment to serious investigation of this issue. There has to be. It's a scandal. The blood-brain barrier. I can answer that. Sure, of course you could. <laughs> Thank you. So the blood-brain barrier is a natural phenomenon that's designed to uh, prevent toxic uh, substances from crossing into the brain, which is very, very sensitive. So, in fact, most chemotherapeutic agents, in fact, can't be used for brain cancer because they're so toxic to the brain. We know we can break down the blood-brain barrier with certain agents. It's a drug called Diamox that will break it down. There are other agents that will break it down, like radiation, for example, ionising radiation. <clears throat> I am aware of one study that showed that the heat generated from a mobile phone broke down, temporarily broke down the blood-brain barrier, uh, but it does have a reparative ability, so it can you know, get back to normal and be a normal blood-brain barrier. Let me ask you, um, there's some studies suggesting that mobile phone radiation is demyelinating. Mm. And, of course, you know, there are a number of diseases characterized by this. Um, have you any thoughts about that? Have you any of the observations? No, I saw that was, that was in uh, upstate New York, was it? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, look, I, I read the study. It, it wasn't, uh, I don't think, a very good study, and it hasn't been validated. So, no, I don't think it does cause, well, I don't know if it does cause demyelination. Okay. Um, hi, I'm a computer scientist and a teacher, and I'd like to make a comment and ask a question about Wi-Fi. Um, first of all, the comment, I'm very concerned that I've received the risk management form from the Department of Education in Victoria, which clearly says there is no risk of radiation, including microwaves, from iPads, even though I can clearly see that there is a risk noted in the um, instructions or user guide. So that's my comment, I'm very concerned. Um, my second thing is a question. In about 2009, the government in Australia rolled out the digital education revolution, which meant that there's a Wi-Fi access point in every high school learning area. Some six years later, our radiation authority is planning a measurement survey, not a health survey, a measurement survey. I would like to know what you think would be a good health survey that would be of good scientific value um, that would monitor the health of children. As more and more children in Australia are being exposed to Wi-Fi in schools, it's now filtered down to primary schools, and there are some three and a half million children, um, three and a half million students in Australian schools. So what do you think would be a good health survey on Wi-Fi? Well, first of all, the Israeli government with all the issues of what's going on in Israel now, has a national institute on non-ionizing radiation safety, and you can go to it for some information about this issue. They recommend, as, and so does the French, that there is no Wi-Fi at all in kindergarten and earlier, and they recommend limited Wi-Fi, and wherever possible, wired. The technological revolution is here. We want our children to know how to use these resources, but it can be wired 
and banks of wired computers can move from one room to another. You save the money as well. And there is no evidence, as you may know, that digital learning, wireless or wired, actually enhances cognition and retention of information. That has never been studied. We have been sold a bill of goods about the need for everybody to be techie. The Koreans are seriously concerned because they are seeing what they call digital dementia in middle school children, which is characterized by MRIs showing an underdevelopment of the right hemisphere, an overdevelopment of the left hemisphere, a lack of empathy in middle school kids. And think about this on a society-wide pattern. Children who do not have the ability to look you in the eye. And we see the results, the dreadful results, of people who do not have empathy in what happened in Paris. These are serious challenges for modern society today. And I think that the notion that there's no evidence on the dangers of Wi-Fi is, is simply wrong. And the government of Israel, the government of India, the government of Belgium have all expressed concerns about this. And I think what we need to do is to create an international summit where these other countries have taken <coughs> steps to protect their kids come together so that there's a free discussion of what's going on here. Uh, Deborah, I think we might have one more question. Right. And, well, and here it is. I think we should stay um, for one question. Charlie, uh, recently um, a professor of public health at the University of Sydney uh, talked about breast, uh, uh, brain cancer rates staying stagnant from 1982 to 2011, which seems to contradict with some of the breast cancer data that uh, brain cancer I'll data that you've talked about case. today. Um, how does the public really decipher which data they need to listen to and how you do know, we, how do we not yes. be confused by it, all of this? Of, of course, and let me explain. The professor is right if you look at it this way. And bear with me, I know the evening is late. If we look at the age-adjusted rate of brain cancer for everybody in the age distribution, okay, about 60% of all brain cancer occurs in people age 50 and over, right? That's the majority of brain cancers. And that age group is not now the age group with the, that were heavy cell phone users. They were not heavy cell phone users, those people. Yet they, they are still, the majority of cases are older. That's the age-adjusted rate. If you look at the age-specific rate, which is what Dr. Tio is starting to talk about, if you look at the young, kids 20 to 29, 30 to 39, in the United States today, we are seeing an increase in malignant brain tumors in that age group of people who were the heavier users of cell phone radiation. So you have to look at the age-specific rate, and you have to look at the type of tumor. There are more, more than 200 different subtypes of brain cancer, and if you start to slice and dice them, you can certainly make any increase you know, go away. But you're seeing increases in malignant glioma of the frontal and temporal lobe. Now, why would the frontal lobe and temporal lobe be relevant? Because if you wear glasses, metal glasses, that changes the exposure. Metal jewelry changes the exposure. And we don't have modeling of any of that. So yes, the brain cancer rate is flat when you look at that age-adjusted rate, because it's driven primarily, not exclusively, primarily by the older people. But the young is another story altogether. The Israeli Dental Association has issued a warning because one in five cases of a very rare malignant tumor, the parotid gland, is occurring in someone under the age of 20. Under 20. And they've issued a warning about mobile phones in children because Israel at the time they did this was the heaviest user of these devices in the world. Um, so statistics are challenging. I've spent my life working on them. And the age-adjusted rate looks relatively flat. The age-specific rate is starting to show increases in certain types of tumors that we expect to be growing because of mobile phone radiation. And just finally, the largest data bank for brain cancer registration is the CB Trust, Central Brain Tumor Registry of the United States. <coughs> It looks at, it doesn't include all 50 states, it's only 19 states, but it's still the largest bank that we have. And it showed an exponential increase in brain cancer incidence from 2004 to 2008. Uh, it's a little bit slow in coming out between 2012, 8 and 2012, but nevertheless the trend is upwards. 
And that was then shown also in the United Kingdom paediatric brain tumour database, which has also showed an increase in malignant brain tumours, especially ependymomas. Uh, so Britain, the United States, two very large uh, data banks have shown an increase, and Australia didn't. Uh, I'm not quite sure why our figures were different, but it could be well be because of what Deborah was saying, that is the way you just look at the statistics. But uh, the bottom line is I think most authorities do believe that the incidence is going up. But, you know, we're not going to see that huge exponential rise anyway until, of course, the latency period is seen. And the latency period for ionising radiation is very, very long. It's going to be just as long, if not longer, for non-ionising radiation. You really want to wait till the middle of this century before you have definitive proof of harm, before taking steps to prevent it? I don't think so. I mean, I think we've reached enough maturity as a civilization that we can say, let's look at the evidence before us now, and let's take steps now to protect ourselves, rather than insisting on proof that enough people have become sick that all the rest of you and your children and your grandchildren will have been doomed. We can do better, and I'm really delighted to be here tonight because I think we started something that I hope will continue and develop in something very positive for Australia and for the world. Deborah, as I move a vote of thanks on behalf of everybody here, um, I just wanted to point out that Deborah's actually here on a holiday, would you believe it? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, well. Thank, thanks to Dr. Tio for joining the discussion this evening, and thank you, Deborah, for your talk this evening. I think we've all enjoyed the experience immensely, so thank you and good luck on your journey. <laughs>